Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. We hope you're encouraged by the message. For more in-depth content and answers to questions submitted during the sermon, check out our podcast called Postscript. You can find it on iTunes or on our website at faithbridge.org forward slash podcast. Hey, welcome. Glad that you are here today at FaithBridge. Take your Bible. We'll go to Luke chapter 5 if you need a Bible. Why don't you flag down one in the aisles with one of the ushers? They're passing them out right now. They'll be glad to let you borrow one or you can keep it. It's our gift to you if you need one. So let me orient you. If you're brand new today, uh, we are finishing a series today on Jesus before we start a series next week on marriage. We've been talking the past several Sundays about some of the foundations about exactly who Jesus is. We talked on the first Sunday about how uh, he is God and man. And then we talked about how he is the substitute sacrifice for us. And then we talked about how he's life. And he's the only one in whom life is found and nobody else is coming for you, only Jesus. And then uh, last week, Pastor Dan continued the series and he talked to us about how he is Lord and he calls us to take up our crosses and to follow and to uh, live a life of obedience and surrender and so. And it was a challenging message, a wonderful message. Several of you said afterwards, boy, I don't feel like much of a Christian after hearing that message. And so I wanted to circle back and uh, that certainly wasn't the intention of the message. Um, and I want to make sure that we're real clear about something, because I do think that is a sentiment that runs sometimes throughout any number of people who claim to follow Jesus Christ. That sense that I'm not a very good Christian. I don't, you know, I, I want to be a good Christian, but I'm not a very good Christian. And sometimes people sort of feel like, you know, Jesus to me feels sort of like he's the Lord up in the grandstands and he's hollering out like a coach, run harder, run faster, try more. You know, and, and you say of yourself, I just feel like I'm limping along, like I got a cast on my leg and I'm doing the best that I can. I can't do any better. You feel kind of like you're in a, in a stadium and the loudspeaker, you know, voice is saying, boy, you know, it sure would be nice if Jeff could give us a little bit more effort in front of 50,000 people and you're Jeff, you know, and, and you're, you're feeling like, I, why did I sign up to do this? This Christian thing. I can't do this. I'm not good enough. You know, I, I think maybe I'll just quit on the whole Christian thing. If you've ever thought that, then clearly you do not understand the good news of the gospel. Because if the gospel, if the good news was try harder, run faster, you can do better, that would not be good news, would it? That would be bad news for us. No, see, the truth of the matter is the gospel or the good news of Jesus is about a Lord who from heaven looked down upon us in our brokenness and in our frailty and in our sinfulness and said, You'll never, they'll never be able to fix this by themselves. And so that's why he came to this earth and lived the life of perfection that you and I could never live and died the death of suffering on a cross that all of us deserved and then conquered the grave that none of us could ever conquer. And the only uh, prerequisite to becoming a follower of Jesus Christ is the expression of need. It's just the admission of need, just the admission, I can't do this thing called life, not by myself. I need a savior. That's the only requisite to becoming a Christian. That's why we call it good news. And the news gets even better because as Jesus was coming to the end of his life here on earth, that is, uh, his ministry here on earth before he was going back to heaven, he said, now don't despair because I'm going back to heaven because I'm going to send my Holy Spirit who's going to be not only with you, but in you as well. And he's going to give you power. So I'll be in you through the Holy Spirit. And the best news of that is I'll be still doing the things that I've been doing here on earth, restoring people to life, giving you an inner power that you could never have otherwise, absorbing onto my own shoulders your infirmity and continuing to pour out healing upon you. I'm going to keep doing that. Why? Because Jesus is the healer. That's what we're going to talk about today. So in Luke 
uh, chapter 5. Well, before we get to Luke chapter 5, let me just back up and make sure we have a little orientation uh, going in. You have to understand that in Old Testament times, before Jesus came along, when, people of, in, when the people of Israel talked about salvation coming, they didn't think about salvation the way that many of us think about salvation. We tend to, many of us, think about salvation as something that's sort of out there for someday when we die, and then we get to go to heaven. They didn't understand salvation that way. They understood it as here and now. It came really under this one word, shalom. That was the word that encompassed it all. Deliverance, wholeness, healing, salvation, shalom, peace. And, and, and so the Jewish people understood our souls are messed up. Our lives are messed up. Our world is messed up. But God can, and God alone, can heal them all. Only he can bring shalom. Only God can. And then he came to this earth in the man, Jesus. The biblical word for his name, Jesus, uh, not the English word is Yeshua. Yeshua, and Yeshua can be translated in several different ways. It can be translated to mean God heals, among other ways. God heals. Yes, he saves, but Yeshua means God heals. So the New Testament writers, when they came along, they, to, to discuss this ministry that had been happening, that they'd been seeing with their very eyes, they spent a lot of time talking about the healing ministries of Jesus. In fact, uh, researchers say roughly 20%, one-fifth of the whole of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are stories about Jesus doing healing. Clearly, it had captured their attention. It was serving, if you will, as proof that he really was who he said he was. When he said, I and the Father are one, he has seen me, has seen the Father, deity, here's the proof for you. Blind people are seeing and deaf people are hearing and the lame are walking and lepers are being cleansed and seized bodies are being released and, and th this is the proof of it that I really am God in the flesh, because wherever Jesus went, healing was happening. And so, as I mentioned a moment ago, just as he was leaving earth, he said, now, you don't need to despair, because I'm going to be with you always. I'm going to send another advocate, my Holy Spirit, who's going to be in you, all right? As I was saying, also, the four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all reported about healings. None reported more, though, than the gospel writer Luke. You know why? Because Luke was a doctor or a physician. We know that from Colossians 4.14, among other places. Apostle Paul told us he was a doctor. So, of course, he was particularly interested, Dr. Luke was, in all of these healings that he was seeing uh, Jesus doing. Now, with that background and understanding the heart of Dr. Luke, who's going to tell us the story, why don't we read from Luke chapter 5, starting in verse 17, all right? One day, Jesus was teaching the fair. One day, Jesus was teaching, and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were sitting there. They'd come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. And some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they couldn't find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and they lowered him through the mat, on his mat, through the tiles, into the middle of the crowd, right in front of Jesus. So they couldn't get him in the door, and so those four friends, and we know that there were four, not because Luke's account, but Mark's account actually tells us that there were four, which makes sense, one for each corner of the mat, right? They said, we're, we're, we're not giving up. We're going to get you to this man, Jesus, who heals. So they go up on the roof, they take the tiles off the roof, and they start lowering them down, you know, on, on the ropes. And one scholar suggests perhaps those, those four friends then threw in the ropes as if to say, Jesus, he's all yours. We can't bring him out now. It's up to you, you know? And so, so this, is, this is sort of the, the, the setup uh, for what's going on. Before we go on any further, though, let me just mention this. I think it's important when we're talking about those four friends, those rope holders, as Pastor Terry calls those people in our lives. 
I want to ask you this question. Who are your rope holders? In other words, if you had a crisis in your life and you needed someone to help carry you along or to be lifting you up before the Lord in prayer, who, who are those three or four people in your life who are your rope holders? Don't flip it around. Who are you a rope holder for? If they were in a crisis, are they need carrying along? Who are you a rope holder for? I mention it because it's, it's easy for us, especially, especially as Western American Christians, to begin to think that our, our Christian faith is just personal. It's just individualized. It's only about me. It's just about me and the Lord and my devotional life and my prayer life and me with the Bible. And I don't really care about any of the other people. That's not Christianity. Christianity is nothing if not relational. It's about a God who is relational with us, who loved us far more than we ever deserved to be loved. And then once our hearts get a hold of that, he says, now I want you with my Holy Spirit living inside of you to pour this same sort of love out in other, towards other people. And so Christianity is nothing if not relational. That's why around here at Faithbridge, we talk all the time about groups. Perhaps you've heard it said any number of times. Faith Bridge is not a church with some small groups. We are a church of small groups. What we're saying there is if, if you just come into the Sunday service, that's great, that's wonderful, and we want you, and you're always invited, and you're always welcome here, but we wouldn't want you to mistakenly think this is as good as it gets. No, this is just sort of the, the icing on the top. The real crux of what goes on at Faith Bridge is happening in the grow groups. That's why we have the meet and greets like we had two weeks ago, remember, out in the atrium. Any number of you who were sort of like floating particles, you know, out here at Faith Bridge, you're like, I want, and you stopped by some of the tables and you started saying, you know, I think I would be interested in maybe getting plugged into a group around here and have some people who know me and who I know and who pray for me and I pray for and rope holders kind of thing. That's so, so important. That's why we're gonna have another meet and greet next Sunday as well. I hope you won't pass that by. Seize the opportunity, especially if you're kind of a floating particle, you're not connected to anybody um, around here. All right? Because all of us have times in our, need, in our lives when you're going to need that, when you're going to need someone who can carry your mat. Because all of us experience paralysis, if you will. Not necessarily physical, although some of us may be even physical. But there's emotional paralysis. There's relational paralysis. Some of your marriages are paralyzed. And we'll talk about that more starting next Sunday. Some of you vocationally, you're, you're kind of experiencing vocational paralysis. You haven't had a job and you're in between. And it's been some time. You're all locked up. and You're like, ah, what is going to happen? And all of us have this need sooner or later for some people who can come into our life and say, hey, I'm rooting for you. I'm praying for you. And you're going to make it. We're a church of groups here at Faith Bridge. Okay, so look at Jesus' response. When Jesus saw their faith, that's not the faith of the man that just came down. That's the people peeking through the roof up there that threw the ropes in. Jesus said, friend, your sins are forgiven. Now, this, of course, was another not-so-subtle uh, example of Jesus claiming deity at this point, because what, what, what he's doing in this moment is he's looking at that man's eyes and into his soul, and he's saying, let me tell you something, first of all. Before I heal your body, before you get up and walk, I'm going to heal your soul. I'm going to absorb your sins out of you onto me. Okay, I want to forgive your sins, which is the need of every single person because humanity is fallen, is broken. We're all infected with sin. And so there's no greater need than this need for forgiveness. And he speaks straight to it, says, I'm going to forgive your sins. Now, the snooty religious people who are watching, they're like, wait, 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 what did, what did he just say? Did he just say that he's forget? He nobody can forgive sins except for God. And you kind of picture Jesus looking up out of the corner of his eye and saying, "Hey, I've been telling you, I and the Father are one. And if you see me, you've seen the Father. And connect the dots, you know." They, and and so, right now, you're watching something happen that you need to pay attention to. Okay, so verse 21: The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, "Who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy?" 
Who can forgive sins but only God? Jesus knew what they were thinking and he asked, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or get up and walk. What's he doing here? He's using a little logic. He's saying, yeah, it'd be real easy for anybody. To do. It'd be easier for me to say, yeah, your sins are forgiven. And, but how would you know, right? I could walk up and say, well, your sins are forgiven. They're absorbed out of you. And it, but how would you know if that transaction really happened? What Jesus was doing is he, he was saying, look, look if, 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 <laughs> if you'll pay attention, what I'm doing is I'm doing a twofer. I'm giving this man what he needs at the deepest level. I'm gonna heal his innards. But then as proof to the rest of you, I'm gonna heal his outers as well. Hope that you can finally get it, that if I can do that for his insides, of course I can do this for his outsides. So he forgives him of his sin. And then he says, rise up and walk. Verse 24, but I want you to know that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. And immediately the man stood up in front of them and he took what he'd been lying on and he went home praising God. And everybody was amazed and gave praise to God and they were filled with awe and they said, we have seen remarkable things today. And when you come into an account like this, it's easy for any number of us to, to close our Bible and say, I really wish... I could have been there then. I just wish I could have been there just to see that happen. Some of you, if you're in a a broken state or a state where you're needing some healing, you've even perhaps thought, I just wish I could be there then so I could be the guy on the mat who got the healing that day. Boy, I wish I I could uh, have been there. But I wonder, have you yet realized that the same Lord who was doing those things then is still doing them now? The Bible never said that he was, you know, that's all folks, thank you, good night, Houston. That's all the healings. It never said that. It just keeps on going. In fact, Jesus said in John chapter 14, 12, whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing and they'll do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. And when I go to the Father, I'm sending the Holy Spirit. It's gonna be right there in your midst, right there in your soul. And so don't despair when I go back to heaven. It's not like I'm packing up all the miracles. I'm coming right back in the form of my Holy Spirit to live inside of you. Greater things yet will you see with your own eyes. Now, in a few minutes, we're gonna come and we're gonna have the Lord's Supper or communion, Eucharist, whatever you're familiar with calling it, where we take the bread and the cup and partake and remember Christ's sacrifice on the cross. But we're also gonna have some people who are stationed up here to pray. You say, what are they gonna pray for? They're gonna pray for you. If you'll stop by, you say, what are we gonna pray about? We're gonna pray about what we're talking here. Because we're just aware, I, I read the prayer requests every week that come in on these connect cards. I mean, hundreds of them, they just come in there. Pray for my cancer and the heart and on and on, my relation, my marriage is unraveling. I mean, there's just so much brokenness. And so that's why when we were preparing this service several weeks ago, we said, we just need to have a time of prayer and just let people get prayed over for healing. And so I hope that you won't pass up the opportunity uh, when it comes in, in just a little while because Jesus is still the healer. He's still bringing shalom wholeness, deliverance, peace, healing. And you don't have to only just wait till heaven to get it. All right. I read the most interesting account over the summer break. I was reading actually a number of books, but one in particular was a book in which I was reading about this Anglican bishop whose name is John Taylor. And he was reporting about a missionary nurse 
illustrating this power that comes through the healing name of Jesus. So this missionary nurse was serving in a hospital in Peshawar, a remote city in Western Pakistan. And an English hippie named Henry wandered into the hospital one day and he was terribly ill. He was a heroin addict. And since heroin was plentiful and cheap in that region, he'd been living there for quite some time. And besides being an addict, he had contracted several other diseases, including hepatitis. And so he ends up in the hospital and he responds positively to the treatment, but he refused to stay in the hospital. But why? Because he craved the heroin too much. So before he was completely well, but when he was strong enough to get up, he, he discharged him and gets out and leaves and he's wandering around in the community again. However, it wasn't long before his health deteriorated again. And one day he was roaming around on the countryside and he fell unconscious and he was found lying on a hillside by an older man named Ahmed. Now Ahmed was a fierce, rugged, regional tribesman. He was a devout Muslim And he picked Henry up and he carried him to his own village and he began to nurse Henry back to health again. But Henry was still an addict and and Ahmed knew it. So actually Ahmed for a season, knowing he couldn't live without the drugs, he supplied Henry with the heroin. However, one day after his health was improving again, Ahmed began to talk straight to him about this addiction. And because he had served in the British Army as a young man, he, he, he could speak in broken English. And he, he said, uh, Henry, you need help. There's only one hope for you. You must pray and you must ask God to deliver you from your addiction. But, Achman said, Henry, when you pray, don't pray to Allah. Pray to Isa. That's Arabic for Jesus. He said, pray to Messiah Jesus. He's the one who can heal you and can set you free. And so in desperation, Henry took Achman's advice to heart and he began to cry out to Jesus and he was miraculously delivered and he was set free. And so he's experiencing, Henry, is this, this shalom Not long afterward, he went back to the hospital for some further treatment and the nurse who had worked on him before, she couldn't get over the dramatic change from the first time that he came to the hospital because now he's cooperative, now he's polite, now he kept talking about the Lord Jesus, the one who had set him free. And one day she said to him, Henry, how in the world did this happen to you? Who out here told you about Jesus anyhow? And when he told her it was about, it was a tribesman named Ahmed who lived in a certain village, she couldn't believe it because she knew Ahmed. And she knew what a fiercely devout Muslim he was. And she's puzzled and thinking, why would he tell Henry about Jesus? Well, sometime later, long after Henry had gotten healed up and gone back to England, Ahmed ends up in the hospital himself. She had a chance to ask him. She said, Ahmed, do you remember a British hippie, Henry, heroin addict. Do you remember that guy? Oh, yeah, I remember that guy. She said, well, you know, he, he came in twice, and the second time he was a different man, a new man. He'd been healed up, and he talked about Jesus a lot, and I finally asked him, who told you about Jesus? And he said, Ahmed, you did. Have you become a follower of Jesus Christ? And Ahmed was indignant, and he said, no, I am not. There is one God, Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. That is what I believe. She said, okay, so then you have to explain to me, why did you tell Henry about Jesus? And she said, he said, oh, madam, for ordinary people in ordinary situations, you should pray to Allah. But in cases like this one, where there's really no hope, and where the power of Sithen, that's Satan, has complete hold of a person, then there's only one name to pray to, Isa, Jesus. Only Isa can save us from Sithen's power, he said. This I firmly believe. Well, 
when I finished reading the story, I just had to set the book down and ponder that. Two thoughts in particular. I had one, I thought, gosh, it's so sad on the one hand that, that Ahmed could, could get that close to Jesus to acknowledge he's the one you pray to if you need healing, but he's, and he yet couldn't connect the dots to the fact, yeah, that's why he's the Lord. That's why he is God. He's the one true God. I thought, gosh, what a sad thing. But then I was, I was indicted or convicted. I felt convicted inside my soul. Because then I started thinking, well, gosh, here's a Muslim man telling people about the power of Jesus and pray to Jesus, and he's the one who can heal you, and he's the only one who can heal you, and if it's serious. And I began wondering, do I call people to prayer in Jesus' name for healing as readily and as frequently as he. I wonder the same about you. Do you do that? Do you call out to Jesus? Do you lead people towards Jesus talking to you, saying, hey, we should pray to Jesus about this for healing? I think the tendency in any number of our souls is just to say, well, let's call the doctor. Let's take the best steps that we can take. Da 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 da. We can fix this. If we really buckle down, we're just going to, we're just going to. instead of saying, you know what? This one's serious. Let's go to Jesus first and foremost. He's alive and he still heals. Now, the tricky thing about this when you talk about healing is that there's no formula to this. People have come along and they've tried to formulize it and say, well, you know, if, if you don't get the healing, it's because you didn't have enough faith. So it's really your fault. Well, that's a big guilt trip, you know, and other people say, well, this is the way it works. or this is the way it works. You know, or if your name's A through M, you know, this is your month, you know, better luck next time if you're a W, you know, maybe then next, maybe next month. There's no formula to, to how this, this healing works. Scripture just makes it clear where to call out to him and ask for it. Keeping in mind, of course, uh, ultimate shalom, eternal shalom will only ever be found on the other side. Okay? So what we're asking for on this side is really one of two things. We're asking for one thing, a miracle. You say, what is a miracle, by the way? A miracle is simply the postponing of the inevitable or the expediting of the ideal. It's the expediting of the ideal. It's the speeding up of the ideal or the slowing down of the inevitable. All right? So take the person who is diagnosed with cancer and, but God does a healing and they go in for their next test and the doctor's like, we don't understand this and where'd it go? It's here and it's not here and how do you explain it? I don't understand this. We say, okay, God either expedited the ideal or he postponed the inevitable. However, it, we, we'll take it. And Jesus gets the glory. And that person lives maybe 10 years or 20 years or 30 or 40 more years, Right? And we say, praise the Lord. But we always keep in mind, eternal shalom is the ultimate shalom. Hey, none of, all of us are gonna die sooner or later. Even the person who got healed is gonna finally lie in a casket. They're finally going to cross over, okay? So, so let's, let's keep that in mind when we're talking about healing. And, and then let's answer this question as well, because this is the second question that comes up. The, the, okay, well, what about if I don't get the miracle? Some of you are like, you're, you're, I've been praying and praying. I've been praying for weeks. I've been praying for months. I've been praying for years. I've been confessing all my sins. I've been fasting. I've been doing that, da, 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 and it's just not coming. What's going on there? Well, let's ask Apostle Paul. There's no Christian greater than Paul. And you remember, he talked about that in his own life. He said, yeah, yeah, I had that too. I had this thorn in my flesh. He never tells us what the thorn was. Some scholars read between the lines. Sometimes he talked about his eyes. and his heart. Maybe he had some partial blindness or something like that. We don't know. But it's in 2 Corinthians 12, he says, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul said, I'll boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses 
so that Christ's power might rest on me. Now, this is helpful for me to consider because it reminds me that even when healing doesn't come in exactly the way that we've been asking for it, he's still at work. So he might not be giving the miracle that particularly we wanted, but he's still giving the miracle of his all-sufficient grace without which we would just collapse like a puddle and we wouldn't make it and we wouldn't go on. So either way, whatever he gives, he gets the glory. And he gives us both so that we'll point other people's hearts and minds and eyes towards him. Not so that if or when a miracle comes along, we can just go off into our little corner and say, wow, that was just really great. I feel so much better now. No, but rather that we'll go off into the world and say, wow, let me tell you what God did. And if, if he can still do that, that means he's alive and he's well and he's powerful and you should really let your life belong to him and him and your life and you should see, I don't know what he'll do in your life. But he's real and he is the Lord. And he still heals. So I'll tell you one more story and then we'll come for uh, the Lord's Supper and healing prayer. It's a story I've told before here. I look back, it's been six years, so a lot of you have come along uh, since then and you haven't heard it. It's a story that has to deal, has to do with, I guess you could say, my conversion, not to Christ, but my conversion on this subject of healing from being a skeptic to being a believer. It goes back, I guess, 25 years or so when, when I was in seminary, in graduate school, learning how to become a pastor. And, I, and one of the classes I was taking that semester was a class called Healing in the, in the Christian Tradition. And the professor would, be, it was like any class, you're taking notes, you're reading books, and, and, and all. Well, one night we get to the class, it's an evening class, and the professor walked in and he said, class, I have invited Dr. So-and-so to come and teach the class this evening. Well, pretty much everybody knew who Dr. So-and-so was because he had been the teacher of this class back in the day for years, but he was retired now. And, and so I thought, well, that's interesting. We'll get to hear from this old guy. And so <clears throat> he introduced him and, and, uh, and that pr retired professor began to teach us. So we're taking notes and he's telling us interesting, pointing out some of the verses we've looked at and talking about this. And, and, um, and then uh, almost as if he just kind of was having an ADHD moment, he was like, I think somebody here needs healing right now. And I thought to myself, the class just got weird. Oh boy. And, <clears throat> and so uh, he says, and he wasn't moving on. He was like, no, 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 really. I, I think someone in this room needs us to pray some healing prayer for them right now. Well, all of us were like, it's not me, you know, and, and then finally, Sheeplishly, one lady, she, she raises her hand. Her name is, uh, was Linda. And I knew Linda, and Linda was normal. And I thought, oh, Linda, you're getting drawn into this deal. And, <clears throat> and, and he said, what's the problem? And she says, well, the problem is I have a, a horrible back. It, it, every morning, my husband, Hugh, has to, to massage my back for about 15 or 20 minutes before I can even get out of bed and start to walk. And then I go through and I take Advil all day and all this medicine. And, and then at night and on and on. I thought, wow, I, I didn't know that. But I knew Linda and Hugh and I liked them. And they were a cute little couple. They were both in seminary, sort of a married couple. And they'd walk around and they'd go to the library and study together. And for anybody who was single, as I was, you know, we thought, that's what I'd like some days, you know? And, and so they, they were just cute and normal. And here she is telling this story. And I'm like, I didn't, you always seem smiley. I, I didn't know that was going on inside of you. And the old professor says, okay, well, uh, Linda, we're gonna pray over you. And he said, I'm gonna ask you to just come and sit in this chair and uh, we're gonna just gather around you. And I'll ask class that uh, maybe two or three of you will pray aloud. And then the professor said, I'll, I'll, say the, I'll close the, the prayer. Well, I wasn't going to be one of the praying people. So I'm kind of like, I'm watching this deal, but I, <laughs> I don't know. And so one person prayed, and then another person prayed, and then the professor closed it up. And, and then we all looking at, you know, <laughs> how are you doing? And, well, 
you know, she smiled and said, thank you very much. And sort of wiped a tear out of her eye. And, and he, he said, now class, you can go back and sit in your desks. And so everybody went back to their desk and we, we continued the lecture. Well, about two or three days later, I saw her uh, at a different place uh, on the campus. And I went up to her and I said, Linda, I have to ask you something. What, what happened there that night in that class? Because I'm trying to figure out, was that like real or was that weird? I just, um, she said, you know, Ken, I'll be honest with you. I don't know what happened, but I can tell you this. Hugh has not had to, to do that whole massage thing every, I just bounded out of bed the last few mornings. I haven't taken any Advils. I'm, it's like something happened. I'm like, really? Well, I want to get back with you because I want to see if that lasts, you know? And, and so, um, so several weeks later, I saw them in the library and they were making photocopies of some big journals. And, and so I go over to, to uh, the copy machine. Hey, Hugh and Linda, how are you doing? And I was like, how's the back? And she said, it's really, an, it's Hugh chuckled. And he said, you know, Ken, I, I wasn't there that night, so I didn't see what y'all did, but I can attest something happened that night. Well, we graduated and went on. They lived in Mississippi and I came back to Texas and didn't see each other for several years. Well, I went back and I was at a conference several years later and they were there and they were coming down the sidewalk and I saw them and I make a beeline and they started laughing when they see me coming to it because they knew what I was going to ask them. And so I get up to them and, and I said, so you got to give me an update. It's been several years. How's the back? And Linda said, Ken, I don't know how to explain this other than to say God did something that night in that class when I sat there and several of y'all prayed over me. He healed me. I don't know how else to explain it. How do you explain something like that? You don't. You don't have to. I don't have to. <laughs> I realized that at the end of the, when I was preparing. I'm not God. I don't have to explain it. That's the whole thing. So we just give him the credit and we give him the glory. And we say, now, Lord, won't you do it again? I think that there's some people here. Surely, I know there are. I read your prayer requests who need healing. And I have no formulas and I wouldn't presume to say, you know, if you do this enough, then, then you'll really, I'm not gonna do that. But I will pray for you. And we've got prayer partners who are gonna come up momentarily and in both rooms who will pray for you as well. And let's just do what we did in the earlier service. A lot of people came. We prayed for people who needed physical healing and cancer and this, da, da, da marriages, addiction, I mean, just you, you name it. You just come and you whisper to whoever that person is that's in front of you and you just tell them, here's what I need. And you just let them pray for you.